Step 4, differential form. So we have seen how to rewrite Maxwell's first and second equations uh, from integral form in the uh, differential form. And we can do the same thing for Maxwell's third and fourth equations. So let's see how to do that. I will remind you that uh, we have defined this del uh, operator as a differential operator in lesson 7. And it's denoted by this vector del, and it's, it's got components given by d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz. So remember, it's a vector. And we saw that if we just uh, apply it to a scalar function given by some uh, um, components x, y, variables x, y, and z, what we get is known as the gradient of the scalar field. And this is a multivariable generalization of the usual gradient of a, a one-dimensional function. So it tells us in which direction the function is changing, and the magnitude tells us how much it is changing. We have also seen that we can uh, sin, uh, um, compute the divergence of a vector field by applying the dot product between the del operator and the vector field itself. So, this led to the divergence theorem that related the di uh, surface integral of a vector field to the divergence of the field inside an enclosed volume V, where it's enclosed by the surface A. So, we have seen two operations. We have seen uh, multiplication by a scalar, we have seen the dot product with another vector, we are still missing the third possible product between two vectors, and that's the cross product. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this step. So when we take the cross product of the del operator with a vector field, that's known as the curl of the vector field. Sometimes in books it's denoted by curl of the vector field, or simply as del cross product with uh, the vector field. So we can go ahead and just compute it to see what it looks like. So the cross product between two vectors can be computed as the determinant of the following matrix, where at the, tops, at the top we have the unit vectors uh, ex, ey, ez. Then in the second row we've got the uh, differential operator del, d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz. And in the bottom row we've got the components of our vector field ex, ey, and ez. And the determinant is computed in the following way. We say that the um, a component of uh, the cross product along the x direction is given by the determinant of this smaller matrix over here, this 2 by 2 matrix. So it's dEz by dy minus dEy by dz. That's the x component over here. The y component is given by 2 by 2 matrix given by this row over here and this row over here. So it's dEx by dz minus dEz by dx, and the final component along the z direction is given by this expression over here. So this is all, all nice, but what does it really mean? So I will remind you that the divergence of a vector field really tells us how the vector field converges or diverges. In other words, it tells us uh, how the field lines of the vector are spreading away or they are converging towards each other. So if the divergence is positive, then we know that there's a source uh, a term uh, or there's some source of the vector field that uh, makes the field lines spread away from each other. So a good way to think about it is if you have a, a, a positive charge uh, in, the, in, in the middle here and the electric field lines are spreading away from it. On the other hand, if you have a negative divergence, that means that there's a sink. And that's that can be thought of as a negative charge, where all the field lines are pointing towards the negative charge, in other words, they are converging together. The curl tells us about the rotation of a vector field. So if you have a vector field that's doing something like this, where it's rotating, then the magnitude of the curl of the vector field will be positive. On the other hand, if you have a vector field where it doesn't have a rotating component. All the field lines are pointing along its direction, even though the field lines are kind of changing uh, in strength, the, the vector field is changing in strength, it's still not rotating, therefore its curl would be equal to zero. So now, 
In the context of Maxwell's equation, how does the curl help us? Well, I will remind you of the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem re uh, relates the divergence of a volume to the flux through the volume's surface. That's why we are considering all these spheres in the previous lesson, and we were looking, and we were asking the questions, what, what is the flux through the surface? There was either some source of an electric field, or there was a sink, um, uh, in, in other words, a negative charge inside the surface, and we were relating it to the divergence of the field of the volume enclosed by the surface. What we can do is we can use the Stokes theorem that relates the curl over a surface to the line integral over a boundary of the surface. Mathematically, it can be expressed in the following way. We have the curl of a vector field over some integrated over a surface, a closed surface. Sorry, it doesn't need to be closed. But the loop over which we are integrating the uh, vector field has to be closed. So this L is the boundary of the surface A. So here, just to remind you, when we go from the divergence, we, we are considering the divergence of a volume, and then we go to flux through a surface. So we basically decrease the dimension by one. We go from volume to surface. In the Stokes theorem, we look at the curl over a surface, and then we decrease the dimension, and we consider the line integral over the boundary of the surface. So now we can apply it to our Maxwell's equations. To remind you, in integral form, we've got the following expressions. Maxwell's third equation is the line integral of the electric field is given to the um, a negative rate of change of the magnetic flux through the surface uh, who has the boundary L. And for Maxwell's fourth equation, we do the same thing. We want to know what is the line integral over a closed uh, uh, loop of the magnetic field, and that's given by the following expression. It's mu naught times the um, surface integral over the um, current density and the displacement current density, which is expressed here as the change in the, mag in, in the electric field. So what we do is we substitute from our Stokes theorem for, uh, into this left-hand side. So we change the line integral into a surface integral, and then we equate the integrals. And what we get is the following. Substituting over here, we get that the curl of the electric field is equal to the negative of the uh, time derivative of the magnetic field. Remember, now by using Stokes theorem, we are changing the line integral into a surface integral. So in order for the left-hand side and the right-hand side to be equal, the integrants must be equal themselves. So we arrive at this expression, M3. And similarly, for Maxwell's fourth equation, we substitute for the line integral of the magnetic field, and what we get is that the curl of the magnetic field has to be equal to the integrand on the right-hand side, so it's just mu naught times the current density plus uh, epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times the time derivative of the electric field. And we are done. These are the differential forms for Maxwell's third and fourth equation. And we are also done uh, with discussing the derivation of Maxwell's equation. In the, what follows next, we will see how to uh, apply these equations to see to derive the electromagnetic waves.